<laughs> Thank you very much for being here now for the round table. Uh, I won't say much because you already know Manu very well, probably. And he speaks uh, much better than me. So welcome to him and the floor is yours. Thank you very much all for being here today. So thank you all for being here. It's a pleasure coming back home for the first time. Uh, thank you very much for the Quality Commission. It's a pleasure that you have accepted to, to mm -hmm. give this talk in this day, which is so important for us. I would just like to give a very little introduction about Gracia. Gracia is a group of people who are behind all these activities that we are organizing for the Pride Week. Uh, Gracia was born like, Gracia is like a working group of people working at the IIA interested within all these LGTB issues. We are part of the Equality Commission and I'm very, uh, we are very glad that these events are taking place today because it's, it was born like a joke we say that okay we are um, people interested in these kind of subjects let's do something and we are we are finally making something apart from the wonderful talk that eleonora has given before and from this round table i strongly invite you to go to the demonstration who will take place this friday at 7 30 from the square of isabel la catolica right yes so every last year we were all, we went there all together like as the IIA. I think it was the first time that the whole institute was there and it was very positive. So I strongly invite you to, to come here, to come this year. So now let's give the word to the to our guests. Uh, thank you very much for coming here. I will start from Oscar here and the idea is that we are going to, I am going to introduce you. You will have like 10 minutes if you want to speak about the subject and uh, about whatever you want, and when you when we finish after forty minutes, we will give the the word to the public, to the public, okay, to the audience, and we will make a, a question and answers session. So first of all, I will start by my beloved friend Oscar Huertas. He holds a degree in biochemistry. He is doctor in microbiology and master in biotechnology and scientific culture, and expert in management of communication projects and scientific dissemination. After a short period of 10 years in research, he moved to a, he moved on to communication with the association Hablando de Ciencia, where he is the president currently. Then with his own company, La Niaquea Management and Communication, and later at the university, he's also the treasurer of, of the Spanish Association for Scientific Communication. And he's currently the head of communication at the DASTI. UG Herb Institute. So the goal I, I have forgotten to, to speak about that. The title, the title of this uh, roundtable is LGBTQ Plus Roundtable towards a more diverse and inclusive science. So the first question for you is I would like to be interested in your personal uh in the in your personal path within science, being being a person from the community LGTBI. Mm -hmm. Thank you. First of all, I, I would like to, to thank to the Institute of Astrophysica for organizing this session. Sure, you can. Okay. No? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Mm -hmm. I would like to thank to the to the Institute for organizing this session, um, all of you to for coming uh, to um, participate in it. Um, my dear Manu, uh, because uh, he knows it's uh, all hard is for me to accept this invitation. Um, the first thing I would like to well, <laughs> the first thing I would like to say is that I have had more negative, inappropriate, uh, hateful, and derogatory comments um, at my workplace because I'm fat more than because of my sexual orientation. And the reason is very clear: uh, my obesity is visible, but my sexual orientation is not. Um, how could uh, anyone notice about this? Because I'm a white man, uh, this man uh, with a partner in the opposite sex, and I have that side. So it's, it's logical that my sexual orientation is not the reason for, for these comments. Um, most bisexual people find it easier to come out of the closer uh, uh, being a gay or lesbian uh, people or appearing to be strides on the axis of the society, depending on the, the life of experience. 
This is in line with the first idea I want to bring uh, to this table, uh, which is that the people of bisexual orientation uh, are much less out of the closet than gay, lesbian people, or trans, or, or other people. Um, I guess that's why we are the fourth letter in the LGTB. <laughs> no, it's a joke. Um, <laughs> that's it, it's real. We are more. We are less. Uh, uh, um, we we appear less in in in, in these issues. 75% of the LGBT community uh, have at some point hidden uh, in work. 41% of the community socially out of the closet between 18 to 25 years old have returned to the closet once they enter to the, to the labor market. Um, this, is, this is weird. 44% of the gay person are out of the closet at work, uh, 38 of the lesbian people, but only 14% of the bisexual people are out of the closet in the, in the work environment. And there may, may be several reasons for, for that. One is we are less, obviously. Uh, the second will be uh, less of a historical struggle of the community uh, to make uh, basic, uh, bisexuality uh, visible. But uh, perhaps is that we are a reality that is uh, uncomfortable, uh, even uh, within the community. Uh, it is still considered that it's a face, but believe me, it's not a face. Um, I think that is this, this still typically image of what is a man or what is a woman is not is still not totally um, deconstructed in the in the society. And um, the other one is uh, that it can also be influenced by the lack of uh, reference. The second idea I, I, like to, uh, I would like to contribute is that uh, I believe that science popularization, science outreach, has done a lot uh, to make the LGBT community more visible in general. Um, I think it's, it has also done a lot for the visibility of women in science and technology, but I think it's, uh, this is true for the, for the community. We, the polarizers, uh, have public uh, profiles, and uh, along with our work, we expose our life, expose our way of life. So somehow it's, it's a way to, to expose that, uh, that kind, of, that, uh, that uh, phase of our life. Uh, I have organized uh, uh, dozens of events. Uh, I have always tried to make into account uh, several criteria. The gender, uh, the gender parity is one of, uh, one of them, but also the, the diversity. At uh, the Desarando Ciencia uh, event in the sixth edition, uh, it was uh, very curious uh, on things that happened. Uh, we, we decided to, to do a, a thematic session, and one of, uh, of the sessions was the rainbow sessions in which people from LGBT community um, issues affecting our community uh, were given visibility. We, we received a lot of critical voices uh, from persons who didn't want to participate in, in the session because they feel that they were invited only because uh, they belong to the community. Um, others that feel that it was unnecessary to, to say that these people are gay, trans, or whatever. But above all, uh, that year, the, the session, the, the rainbow session, was the, the most attractive uh, of the of the whole attention in the media and, and, and in, the, in the program. The curious thing is that no one was invited to the session who had not participated in the Grand of Ciencia before. So, in other words, the diversity was already part of the event, and the problem uh, somehow is to make it visible, and that's why we did it. But that was new. Hmm? That was new. You was oh yes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, but you come this year to Granada. <laughs> yeah, I, I wasn't in the city before. Yeah, <laughs> Look, I cheated. <laughs> um, with the with this issue. <laughs> It was an amazing session <laughs> <laughs> of the visibility of the community in in size. Come the third topic I, I would like to, to talk about um, on these issues. The fears arise. The fears uh, appear. Just as women sometimes uh, wonder whether they have been invited because they are women or for the works, 
sometimes the, the LGBT community also wonder whether the, the same things happen in certain environments. Um, there's a question that I have not resolved. Uh, do we have to make it visible or do we have to normalize the situation? For me, the idea, uh, the idea uh, will be that the data uh, uh, tell us that women and men access to the position of responsibility with the same frequency, but it's not. Uh, I would like, I would love that the data tell us uh, that no one has to go back into the closet because they began to, to work in, in one site um, for sexual orientation or gender identity, but the data doesn't tell us that. So the data tell us that the 29% of the trans and bisexual people have experience of, of harassment. 26% of the uh, people experience dis discrimination and 8% of these people have experienced assault. So as long as the data says that, normalization is not possible. Science and technology is uh, relating with, with uh, mental health is uh, very deteriorated. The predoctoral uh, person suffered twice in the mass stress, depression, and suicide than the rest of the population. So, if you add an additional factor of stress or discrimination, um, things get worse. So, this is between the three ideas uh, I want to. Unfortunately, I mean, we will discuss about that later on, but unfortunately, when you are a LGTB. Uh, Q plus people, you have to be going out of the closet all your life, all your life. You arrive to your new job and you have to explain everybody again that you do not have a girlfriend, that you have a boyfriend called Robert and which is like that, etc. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm very glad also to introduce you our second guest, uh, Rocio, Ro I, I have said Rocio, Rocio, Rocio Sola Jimenez. She studied art history at the University of Granada, so she's like <laughs> she's uh, an art historian between scientists right now. Uh, they hold a master's degree in comparative studies in literature, art, and thought, and a doctorate cum laude in, in humanities from the Pompe Pompeu Fabra University in Barcelona. Their main lines of research address the question of space and landscape in avant-garde art from the theory of effects, although they have also specialized in German literature of the interwar period in terms of gender, as well as in queer and LGBTQIA plus press studies in the Weimar Republic. They have recently completed a Margarita Salas research at a stay at the University of Granada in the Department of Art History, have participated in several research projects with European funding, and is coordinating a book on German and Austrian women writers in exile in the interwar period. In Granada, they are a member of Antiracismo Granada and an, acti an, an active member of the Coordinadora del Orgullo Critico, Critical Pride Coordinating Committee. Uh, welcome, Rocío. Thank you very much. I would like to ask you, I mean, I, I know that you are um, you are an expert, let's say, on this queer theory, etc. Could you explain more about that to this audience. I think more, most, most of us we do not we are not aware about this queer movement. Sure. Thank you very much. And uh, first of all, like good afternoon and thank you also for the institutes for inviting me here and being like the weird little artistic person uh, within scientists and brilliant people. And um I feel a little bit of pressure and I feel overwhelmed being surrounded by such a brilliant environment. And I think that I have to make a very good performance on behalf of my fellows artists and human yeah, yeah, humanity researchers. And so I think that queer theories and queer methodologies are very, uh, very well linked to what the previous seminar was about, like intersectionality, because I think that Within queer theories, we are discussing um, things like a little bit different, no? Uh, by, the research, by this kind of research, we enhance this self-reflective awareness. So, I mean, we have to be very aware of ourselves, or history, or experience. Experience is something very important, like I'm connecting with what my colleague Oscar was saying. And the the main position of queer methodologies is to stand against this um reinscribing the subject in these fixed notions of gender sexual and racial issues 
And by that, I want to also thank this privileged space and this privileged place of uh, talking because my, me, myself, I feel very privileged to be here. And I also feel that there's a lack of certain kinds of people in knowledge, in science, and in university in general. And I'm not only talking about LGBTQA plus people, I'm also talking about racialized people and racialized queer people, which actually do exist, which actually come into universities and they're also lured by this idea of inclusivity. And sometimes I fight a little bit against this word because I feel like when we talk from the Western academia uh, settlement uh, about inclusivity, it's like, like if we were in a birthday party and we were saying, no, no, just come over. We have some cake, it's our cake. You may have some, but if you misbehave, feel free to go out. Because I think that there's a over policing over these certain profiles of people, whether you are LGBTQ, whether you are a, a racialist person, you have to behave. In a western, uh, in a western society, in a western institution like university and research is, and um, by that I feel that there's some struggles that Oscar was putting into the table that really resonates with my experience because I feel that as bi people are more closeted. Let's talk about non-binary. I mean, that's the first time that I'm presenting myself as a Dayton person in research because I, when I was trying to do that the first time, uh, it was at a, at a conference dinner that I was organizing. And uh, this person, I'm not gonna say the name or the charge, <laughs> maybe this person will see that, uh, but there was a person who told me that non-binary people don't exist. And if they do say so, like they exist, um, it's just because they want to hinder other struggles that the LGBTQ plus community have. So it's like, no, you have this problem, this pronouns issue. You have this idea of, I now I have to assume that you're something else uh, outside of the binary norm. And I think that's something that really these queer methodologies and these queer studies are, are also, um, proposing kind of, no? Uh, and by that, I mean uh, not to be very corseted in uh, certain methodologies, certain procedures that are really biased by this thing called the scientific method. I think you might be familiar with that. <laughs> uh, but it also comes from this idea of segmenting, classifying, naming from this Western part of the world, uh, other things, other realities, other procedures of making knowledge, of speaking about experiences that are not ours, are not the, the white people, Western people, experiences and, and ways of perceiving the world. And I think that intersection here is very important. Interdisciplinarity is something that I feel that enriches a lot this scientific um, environment. And I will, um, I will aim people just to be more open-minded to listen other voices, to listen other procedures of making knowledge, of doing in general, to listen other people telling their experiences, and to handle also this kind of discomfort that maybe can come from uh, listening. Something that maybe, I don't know, we think that we're doing that something bad. Oh no, but I'm not a bad person. I'm just very open in this idea, blah, blah, blah. No, just, just hand, let's handle this discomfort, let's hear other people, let's um, let's also consider right other ways of making this kind of uh, researches also, because as an as an human humanities researcher, I don't know, like as a person who comes from the human sciences, I feel like when you're applying for grants or scholarship or things like that, there are two things that always uh, take me back from getting the grant and that is methodologies because I'm not having like a very strict methodology that a person can assume like as a scientific procedure. And it's like, okay, I'm, I'm researching literature. So what has to do a scientific procedure with these kind of studies? And second of all, just because I think it, it has a lot to do with the experience of reading, the experience of handling, of touching, of being in the space where you are researching. 
And the second thing is uh, internationalization. Um, and the, I mean, the main thing uh, that shows that there's a huge internationalization in science is that this conference, for example, this round table is being held in English. And I feel difficult, or I feel like institutions make difficult for us to create networks of knowledge and networks of people uh, with some lasting or long lasting uh, impact in our own communities and within our own people, or I don't know, like uh, building these bridges between disciplines, et cetera, et cetera, because they're always forcing you to go abroad, spend a couple of years in this place, then another couple of years somewhere else, and maybe you're 45 and you don't have a position, which I don't want <laughs> in my life. I don't know. That doesn't sound very appealing to me as a person who also struggles building networks with people and building networks with uh, researchers that understand me and celebrate me and also want to work with me and accepting me by the person I am. And I think that's something that really encourage you to do as uh, young researchers or as, a, as more experienced researchers to build networks to do these mutual aid uh, groups in universities and stop competing that much, stop uh, believing that that's the only way of uh, making progress and start, start listening to each other, start helping each other, caring for each other. And I think that would be mm, like a better methodology in my, in my opinion and a better way of making science a little bit more human. Thank you very much, Rocío. <laughs> uh, our Thank you. Our next guest yeah. is uh, Jara Juana Bermejo Vega. She holds a PhD in physics and computer science. She is specialist in quantum computing from the Technical University of Munich. She holds she is uh, she holds a Ramon y Cajal researcher. Eh, ayuda consolidación and Horizon Ria Principal Investigator at the University of Granada, and she holds a Marie Curie Atenea 3 1 E at the University of Granada, Spain. Have I been clear, more or less? Yes, yes. <laughs> eh, she has been a postdoctoral post researcher at the Free University of Berlin, Germany, between 2016 and 2019. And previously, she was a predoctoral researcher at the Max Planck Institute for Quantum Optics in Munich, Germany. She has a double degree in physics and technical engineering in computer science from the University of Salamanca, Spain. And she's an, an activist for rights, equality, and inclusion in science. She is the co-founder and co-organizer of the QTURN Inclusive Quantum Information Conference held between 2018 and 2023, and the Equal Opportunity Group at, of the Max Planck Institute PhD Net between 2014 and 2017. Before entering here, we have been discussing more or less the issues that we wanted to discuss on this round table. And she has been, uh, she has told me, Manu, I want to speak about harassment in the in the academia just for the for the fact of being a trans woman. So you have 10 minutes and mm -hmm. after was we'll, we will discuss more. So I have a question. Should I speak here? Here? There. Okay. To the other one? To this mic's couple? People, yeah, that one is they're good. They are not common, right? No, no, no. Thank, thank you, Manu. You are adorable. Uh, I'm impressed to see Manu speaking so seriously because uh, we are, uh, you know, several people in the table. We are uh, famous for being among the top leaders in mamarrachismo in this country, <laughs> which is very hard to translate. So, somebody please translate this during the talk. I would like to mention that. Sorry if I'm looking at the, my phone every now and then because I'm trying to hire a postdoc uh from portugal and she's queer and she's having trouble with the administration of the university of granada so i would i'm trying to solve it <laughs> and i would like to mention that i'm very happy to be here with you this is one of the best uh, companies i've ever seen in a panel i'd like to add that uh, i felt quite close to both rocio and um oscar mentioned i am also bi i actually experienced some exclusion because of being fat when i was younger not now but and i I'm non-binary and I relate a lot to the topic of intersectionality. I don't do arts, but uh, yeah, I'm have an artistic side. And uh, this thing that Rufia was mentioning is pretty shitty, sorry for the words. Uh, so uh, myself, I am uh, from Extremadura, Spanish woman. I am 
um, queer, uh, queer in the strongest possible sense. Queer means weird in English. It means desviado, rara. I'm a person that I go everywhere and people look at me like, what is this supposed to be? And so I'm very queer and I'm a very intersectionalist. So I am a queer woman and in trans. Intersection means I belong to several underrepresented oppressed uh, groups. So I'm queer, I'm a woman, I'm bisexual, I'm trans and gender fluid, I'm non-binary and many uh, letters in the alphabet. I am somehow somewhat in the uh, sexual spectrum, but I'm not sure where. I... You are the plus of the... <laughs> yeah, I think I'm the dot, 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 etc. whatever. I am neuro... The Juana. The Juana. And the Jota de Joder. <laughs> How do you remember all of that? <laughs> I am neurodivergent. I am very autistic. I am ADHD and I'm plural. I have several women living in one body and you can see them because I frequently drag. Because I'm also transvestite. That remembers me. The first time I was seeing these guys in, in, in an academic uh, context, there was here in this Journal of Ciencia, a very good drag workshop organized by Oscar and collaborators from this Fernando. So this reminds me of that. Um, so I would like to honor that uh, by saying you should drag more often whenever you want, including in the academic environments. I have given talks wearing demon horns and the talk was excellent. The room was crowded. It improves the quality of scientific presentation a lot. So I am I'm not very weird. Um, the and I well, I work in physics. I I am at uh, this stage of my career where I'm building a group. I right now have a lot of funding and more work than I can handle. So I'm trying to hire uh, people to help me. And curiously, one and a half years ago, I was unemployed. Because I got a Marie Curie position, but I didn't manage to get uh, the ANECA uh, tenure track requirements for, uh, for it becoming permanent. And I lost my contract, and it was pretty fucked. I was fucked in the head. I was seriously uh, having a bad time, I mean, mental health wise. And one of the reasons is I mean, lots of shit happened to me when I transitioned, also. Um, and I, I had problems with uh, getting some enough hours of teaching, which looks very silly, but it's. One, because I was quite international, I like, was doing my degree all the time abroad, it was hard for me to get the hours of teaching. And this is just, um, I mean, this is a specific example, but in the academic career, to become uh, permanent, uh, researchers have to prove themselves perfect at so many different things that sometimes if you have a tiny inconvenience in your life or a different situation than you, normal people or you are not white medium class and your parents are university professors you might have trouble to go through all of this and actually uh, this reminds me that you know, when i try to hire people i always want to you know advertise the jobs from queer people i tried to hire many queer people in the past and it failed so and very often i have found uh, excellent researchers brilliant they are really people i really wanted to work with that had bad grades and the bad grades came from, oh, I just had to work while I was doing the university. Or, yeah, I had to, you know, my parents kicked me out when I transitioned. Or oh, unstabilities that you, you know, when you are just very queer and very weird and very oppressed, and more so you're from some intersectional uh, background, sometimes shit happens to you and your life is less stable. You don't have the stability to study and get good grades. And this happens a lot of queer students, and it's one of the greatest barriers to access the system. Um, starting with many people, for example, many trans women I know don't have the CVs to get close into academia whatsoever. They, some of them, many of them didn't even have enough time and stability financially and time-wise to study and finish their majors. Um, also, this happens to other oppressed uh, women or other intersectional groups. You don't see that many Roma women in academia or that many racialized women. And whenever you belong to several categories, well, more things happen to you. That's, that's what interse intersectionality means, that uh, oppressions do not add up, they multiply. And whenever you are belong to several groups, then more things happen to you. And in the last years, I was actually Actually, my activism started doing anti-harassment activism. That's like my, I don't consider myself a diversity and inclusion activist. I consider myself an anti-harassment activist because the reason why I started doing activism was 
my colleague and friend uh, name prefers don't to be not to be mentioned started stopping mobbing from his uh, supervisor in the technical university of munich and actually this guy was a dude that he was white and he didn't, wasn't the obvious person who receives uh, sexual abuse it wasn't a woman and it wasn't sexual abuse it was a manipulative uh, psychological uh, harassment and mobbing and i have been doing you know safe uh, codes conduct anti harassment protocols and networks to help people who have experienced harassment in the past um, during my career. That's actually why I started doing QTURN. QTURN is an initiative, it's a, a conference we organize where we do diversity and inclusion uh, talks within the program and we try to uh, make the environment safer for people from underrepresented backgrounds. And it's one project that was actually quite successful. The people, for, for instance, uh, usually in physics, we have 10% women attendees, and they're usually in one corner clustering. And that's the woman corner effect in physics. You put some women in a conference, and they all go to a corner. And this happens also to queers and to people who are racialized. And, it's common. and it was pretty, like a very cool conference that we had got like three times more women, for instance. I think it was like a, it's a patch. It's not a solution. It's a, it follows the same system. We have to uh, have a call for papers uh, selection, and many people can get a talk in computer just for on the format itself. And I continue doing anti-harassment protocols in feminist spaces and queer spaces and all kinds of things. I done it in discotheques. I done it in pink parties. And I'm very familiar with it. And in the last year, I've been pretty fucked with this one situation. So I'm going to tell an anecdote I'm living still right now. I currently am working with a person who has a complaint of uh, gender violence and with a psychological violence uh, to their partner, uh, girlfriend, also a student from the same university. Uh, it happened in Turkey, and I'm speaking of this all this so freely because it's on the newspapers, it's everywhere, so it's not hidden information. The uh, but I have to work with this person because this person uh, is actually potentially winning the legal case against the uh, person who is uh, suing. Uh, and now what happens is if you look at the anti-harassment protocols, it all looks pretty bad for like this person got a complaint. Um, a reprimand from the university who we'll, we'll had to leave campus for some time. I mean, students are protesting, and uh, it's in the newspapers. Actually, that never ever happens when you have a harassment case. It normally they get becomes invisible and you don't hear about it. That's the 99.9 percent .9 of the cases. Um, um, so, and I cannot do anything because the person that's uh, potentially the guy is winning the legal case. With a DARVO, DARVO type of defense, they are arguing that the person is actually the aggressor and that the student is crazy and they are attacking back. And now the situation here is this person, well, the European Union that uh, will actually coordinate the project and the universities cannot do anything legally because legally this person is not guilty. And several collaborators believe that he is innocent. And I disagree. And I cannot do anything. Are some people who are also going to go working with him? We cannot do anything whatsoever. And the University of Granada specifically told me um, that um, they will only help me in case that there is a sexual harassment case. They don't, the current protocol we have, it doesn't help you with mobbing or stalking or other types of harassment. And actually, becoming more constructive, I want to argue that we need better harassment and mobbing protocols. Because when this kind of thing happens, our protocols are not good enough. And sometimes harassment is not sexual and it's of a mobbing nature. And you get excluded because your colleagues ban against you because you are weird and you just get isolated in projects. With that, I will pass this to the next speaker. Thank you, Thank you very much for mm -hmm. that. Last but not least, we already know her because she has given a wonderful mm -hmm. seminar just before. Her name is Eleonora Fiorellino. She's from Rome, Italy, and she studied at La Sapienza mm -hmm. University of Rome for her bachelor and her master. She also has done her PhD in astronomy, astrophysics, and space science in Rome, which is joined between NAP, La Sapienza, and Tor Vergata University. 
very complicated. <laughs> During her PhD, she won the ISO studentship and she spent one year at ISO in Garhin, uh, Bay Mountain. After the defense of her PhD thesis in 2020, she started a postdoc in Budapest at Konkoli Observatory. And after that, she came back to Italy where she was currently working as, as a postdoc until this week, because now you're moving to the Canary Islands, right? Uh, she was working, uh, uh, she was making a postdoc at INAF at the Observatory of Naples. Mm -hmm. She will start a new position at IAC in Tenerife in July, so next week. And since she's been studying at the university, she's been very interested in eddy activities. Among other things, she was in the working group for the JEP at Concoli, and she's an active member of the Enough Eddy Work Group named Universe All. She, you have been talking a lot about uh, intersectionality, etc. You're a woman, so you all you know all these gender issues. Fights go together. How do they match? Because I, I always have the feeling that when we organize uh, tables like that, or when we speak about the LGTB movement, we also we focus on the G and mm -hmm. the L, the B, and the T are underrepresented. So, which is your feeling about that? Okay. Um. So, I actually say that uh, I started um, wondering about LGBTQI plus uh, issues. Uh, actually reading the, uh, the second sex by Simone de Beauvoir. Now, you know that she is a feminist, like one of the first ones. Uh, and if you read that book, uh, like it contains uh, the seeds of the queer theory uh, that have been developed uh, later. So um, to me, it's not like, uh, I was born in 1921, so maybe it's also generational, but to me, it's not this, this uh, gender um, equality goal is not, uh, well, it's, it's very related to the LGBTQ plus uh, um, issues. I don't know how to define them. <laughs> uh, it's different, maybe. Um, and I think that um, there are many ways by which we can um, we can consider different kinds of discrimination because I mean this is the the key word that maybe we we fail to mention often. Uh, but the point is that as long as we deviate for from what is defined by someone uh, as the norm, and uh, usually people who define what is the norm is are people belonging to that norm. Um, we start experiencing some kind of, of, of discrimination. And it's not like that there is a discrimination which is higher or more important than another one. So um, luckily I was not the first one talking about intersectionality here and I'm very happy about it. Um, it's just a way to be aware of different kinds of discrimination that are holds in the society. And um, the, the other, so the thing that I would like to mention is that I, um, I'm also an EI activist because I'm a scientist, a scientist, an astronomer, and I would like to do this job. So I'm trying to reconnect with what, um, um, to what um, uh, Ros Rosio? Rosio. Rosio told before. Uh, the academic uh, world is a very competitive and very like vertical. Um, there is a lot of power going on, and there are a lot of differences in power. And uh, I think that this is the link with all the activism against discrimination that we do. I mean, it's a fact that PhD students and postdocs experience uh, very huge mental health issues um, because of this, because of a, a strong disbalance uh, of power. So uh, the, our whole entire careers depend on what our supervisor and the community in general thinks about us. I mean, think about all the recommendation letters. Uh, this is, I mean, this could be very good if you do have a good relationship with your supervisor, or it could be like the death of your academic life. And um, I think this is related to uh, um, gender discrimination, uh, because even in gender discrimination, uh, we're talking about difference in power. Uh, the fact that there is a, a norm which has been defined is only because, historically speaking, 
the people belonging to the norm um, hold the power. It's just a fight. It, it, that, that's only the that that's the point. Um, and um, so the goal, I mean, at least to me, is to try to redistribute the power. And this is something that we should do like on a daily basis. Um, and of course, uh, uh, I mean, it depends on how much power we have. The more power we have, and the more effective we can have, we can do. Um, so either we we have a very important role, like we are the directors of some institutes or the PI of some very large program, um, or we don't have much power. And in that case, we need to do things together to you know gain all the power which is needed to redistribute them. Um, so I will also like add <laughs> uh, another thing uh, to the to the discussion: um, the, the gender, the sexual orientation, the, the race. We already talk about it, but also the uh, the position that you have in the academic system. So basically, we are here in an institute in the academia. So I think that it's good for us to uh, come back to to our job. And I don't know. I think. Uh, before giving the the word to the audience, I would like to make you a question. I mean, I remember that when Gracia and I was born, we were just a couple of people, and uh, at the institute dinners, we started to joke about that, and more and more people started to say, "Yeah," and also in the closet, I would like to be a part of this. I mean, I think there is a elephant in the room, which is the problem of the closeted people. Is it worth it? I mean, and after all the all the explanation that Hara has given to us about harassment, etc., is it worth it? Is it necessary? What do you think about that? Which is your advice for young students closer to uh, what would you say to them? Should I go first? And as you wish. Okay. Um, I mean it's a it's a very private uh thing. So I don't think that it, there is an answer which could be generalized. Mm -hmm. uh, it's very, it depends on the person, and it also it depends on the person in that specific moment, in that specific institution, is what you said. Uh, you're, you're doing, you're coming out like multiple times, and sometimes you can feel do not do it, sometimes you are okay with it. Uh, I, I don't think that there should be a general rule. Yeah. Um, it, I mean, it's a fact, and uh, it is also true, for example, with uh, women in science. Um, I was mentioning this before during the seminar that uh, if you have an example, uh, it could be easier for you to uh, feeling okay, feeling good. Uh, but still, uh, I think no one should feel the pressure to do it only to be the, the example which would ask people. Uh, wait. I think it's quite important to have a network that will support you, either friends, family, or finding new circles. Enjoying it now, there are many actual associations of queer people in research, uh, joining one or going to an event. It's a good thing, I think, like, for instance, in Spain, we have uh, Prisma, they do LGBT events in science, and there is also the Marie Corners uh, conference, which uh, is for all fields, and both of them are pretty good. Uh, in Granada, there are also many queer scientists, so talking to them in person is actually good. There is no general strategy for coming out, um, but in general, uh, if you're in a serious situation where people would not accept you, it's actually good to leave that place because it's not your only option. Um, it's actually good to come out. You, your life becomes much better in general. <laughs> well, uh, there's a said in Spanish when we are going to address a difficult topic, which is open a melon, <laughs> and I think that this, <laughs> this question was a little bit like that. Because, of course, uh, your sexual preference are not the matter of a job interview or a grant application of whatever la like that. 
Uh, but I can get that some work environments may become dangerous or harassing when it comes to uh, coming out in a way that it's visible that you are a little bit deviant or a little bit queer or whatever. And I talk speci specifically about trans people because when, when you transition into one uh, within this binary spectrum, it is clear that something is going on. And I think that that, I don't know, Hala maybe can talk about that better, about her experience in, in Germany. But I mean, it's something that it's being made clear and sometimes it may also carry it with it some issues with your work environment. Or for instance, the example that I was giving before about introducing a little bit, like maybe I'm using like dating pronouns, right? And it was like, three years ago and the answer I received was like okay but that doesn't exist and it's violent I needed to leave the 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 room the dining room because I was feeling like really overwhelmed about that thing coming straight from the mouth of the person that was working with me like my superior at that time and um, some people also about the non-binarism say that if you can see passing, just don't don't get into this mess, right? I'm really I'm very aware that within this idea of non-binary spectrum, I most of people read me as a white woman, and I know that that also plays a little bit of privilege because I can do this uh, this passing thing and pretend a little bit, drag a little bit, like what I was saying, and nothing's wrong, right? But you feel inside yourself that you're not living your own experience, you're not living your own life, you're just faking. Or, I mean, I I really feel myself like empowering this idea of dragging, like this is a very, ah, I don't know, flashy person giving uh, lectures or something like that. And the flashy, the flashy teacher talking about RuPaul or things like that to, to students. But, um, in on the inside you know that there's something that really doesn't fit with that identity and i want also to recall in this table that uh, non-binary people don't owe anyone androgynism or this androgynous uh appearance you can do that if you like you can do that either if you're a butch lesbian or if you're i don't know whatever you just like that aesthetic that's okay it doesn't have anything to do with your gender identity and um, I would say that that's an issue when it comes to, to coming out from the closet, from this particular kind of closet. So me personally, now I'm, I'm taking all the courage that I didn't have past years to say that and to be here and speak about that experience. But I would say that some, in some cases, it can be like a very long, tricky path to to transition to like to to go from one point to the other to explain it, it feels like you have to give explanations every single time okay. about who are you um, but how, why do you look like this but what is like you're being being polite all the time so if you know that your environment is gonna be really freaky about it try to take it easy try to take your time for doing so don't be in a rush just feel your own times, feel your own path, and do your own truth. That's a little bit easy to say, but I think that's the better, the better advice I can give to people in this situation. And in in this in this sense, I think this is important to have the, the side to to talk about it. Uh, it's important to have uh, the Gracia uh, uh, movement just appear, that's just uh, people who talk about it. Um, if, if you have the, the, the opportunity to participate on it, it's wonderful. If you don't want to, it's a feature. I think it's, it's like, you talk about the intersectionality and I really like uh, to talk about all the types of dis discrimination because it doesn't matter if it's about poverty or it's about gender uh, uh, or sexual orientation. It doesn't matter. It's like when when you make adoption for people with the, with disabilities, this is useful for all of us mm -hmm. because it doesn't matter if the, the, the bathroom is bigger or the, the, if you have a ramp. This is useful for all. 
uh, in this kind is, is the same. If, if you have uh, the opportunity to have to, to have this kind of discussion, uh, doesn't matter if you are or not in the in out of the closet. You have the opportunity to to have it. I remember the first time I talked to Hara. She told me I'm very involved in the defense of all the people que está jodida, no? <laughs> Did I say that? <laughs> you will do more like this. Do you want to add something, Hara, or you? I would like to add a few things. So actually, when I was uh, in the closet, uh, people, I, could, I didn't get accepted in a women uh, group because I was non-binary but not woman enough. And when you come out, you get actually a superpower, which is this type of assholes. Um, they avoid you or they exclude you. Uh, so they get out of your way for free. And it's a superpower. Actually, I use this when I go to the park. Some people don't want their kids to play with my kid. And they will literally take their kid and go away <laughs> when they see how trans I am. And they do that. And it's actually like a service. You know, like I would like, I would pay them for doing that. But they do it for free. So you actually, you will lose some people when you come out, but you will become, make, make new friends, make new circles, and they are worth, much more worth than those people who disappeared. So just come out, it's much better. But also, I would like to add, you guys don't look normal. They have never looked normal to me. You have never had normal passing. I'm sorry, don't live in that. What is that fantasy? Like, <laughs> like people can see when you are like them, or when you are not like them, and people detect this very fast in groups in our society. I don't know anything about that why that works because I am a physicist. But the people can see perfectly that you are belong to their group or not. And people always knew I was queer, autistic, and trans from the high school. Like they actually call me uh, maricón, bollera, uh, travesti, uh, sexual, autista in school. <laughs> and they, it was right, so anyway. <laughs> Okay. I love you guys. <laughs> if we agree, we can ask the audience to make questions. Do you have any questions, mm -hmm. Matilde? Inside. I have a question for Rocio. I don't know if I have understood you properly in relation to internationalization. I understood uh, you are against because you feel more comfortable in your community and you are worried about to be accepted in other community. Yeah. I think is I had understood properly or not because I think one of the most exciting thing in research is to be wide network to learn from other culture from other countries. I I understand also perhaps it's a, there is a risk to be accepted, but for everybody, but perhaps it's wrong. Money. I don't know. I I could understand you properly or not. I'm not saying I'm against internationality, but I think that that's a mold that we have to fit in mandatory in order to build a successful career. If you don't get that, you want to be accepted in so many grants. That's why I'm a little bit um, critical with. Because uh, when we talk about internationalization, and I see it also with students, uh, we make this list of countries that are more value than other countries. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter if you just move a lot around the, the South, like the, the South in general, like the plural uh, con conception of South. And um, it would be more likeable, likeable if you just go to, let's say, United States, Canada, Germany, Norway, Sweden, places like this. Um, I see that there's like these uh, countries in the first class, countries in the second class, and countries in the third class when it comes to to science. And um, when I, what I'm saying, I mean, I've been an international uh, researcher too. I've been in Munich, I've been in Finland things like that. But uh, what I think it's a little bit also sad is that this is mandatory. You don't choose to go abroad. If you're researching something, for example, within your own community, uh, it's very difficult to build a prolific career in your country if you don't go abroad. And I think that uh, building networks, as you said, is super enriching, is wonderful and getting people interested in the same field and building this uh, great communication uh, networks is amazing. But the thing that that's the only way 
to build a prolific career. It's what makes me feel a little bit meh. Why? Because if I don't want to, or I have a familiar issue, or I, I don't know, I have to be close to my parents because my father is ill, for example. I don't want to be in Sweden, for example. Or if, uh, I don't know, I have my partner or my, or my cat or whatever, I don't want to be across the Atlantic Ocean. I would love if that's for the sake of my research to make short uh, stays, for example, three months, six months, but with the with the security that I'm coming back to my job, I can again develop my own career in my place within my network. And it's not that thing of being accepted abroad, which I have things to talk about that about my experience in Germany. But um, it's not the fact of being accepted; it's the fact that it's a mandatory thing. What really doesn't resonate with my ways of doing or researching and also with the things of language because i wrote my my doctoral thesis in spanish and most of people were saying why because it's a german author you're in researching like a german illustrator from the early 20th century in austria mm -hmm. and yeah i wrote the introduction and the conclusions in german because that's the thing about and that's the more impact where i'm gonna get from uh but why in spanish everyone was asking me that it's like, because I want to make this person known in my own scientific community. I really think that sometimes we have, it would be beautiful if we could think less about the, um, the grades or the merits or whatever we're getting from these concurrencies and comp competitive environment. And we think a little bit more about our community to give the results of, uh, or research to the community. And I think that maybe is, a, is an issue that um, hits a little bit closer to social sciences and humanities, because of course, uh, we don't sell patents. We don't do anything like palpable you know, to, to mm, I don't know, to increase uh, production or to increase technology or things like that. We're just there doing our thing. <laughs> And that's why I feel also that imposing this kind of norms to every uh, frame or to every discipline in this thing, this white thing that we call science is not very fair, I would say. I don't know if I made myself clear. <laughs> I, think I, don't know what's in... I, I, I totally agree with you. And I don't, I don't think this is the case only for human scientists. I mean, uh, I do stuff from mission, and I always have to say why uh, what I research is useful. It is not, okay? It's just for the sake of knowledge. <laughs> it's just, I don't want to know how a star is formed. But, but I have to lie. I mean, for getting grants, you want to get, you have to lie. You have to say whatever things, machine learning stuff, whatever things. And then you get the, <laughs> yeah, that's true, that's true. Uh, this is how uh, uh, the, the funding is <laughs> uh, No, I mean, uh, I experienced the same. Uh, I'm from Italy, I went to Germany, and I was fluent in English. I was getting my PhD in physics, and people didn't believe I was from Italy. Because, I don't know, what that? I, it's not, I mean, I'm white, so I, I haven't experienced all that kind of racist things that uh, not white people experience, but I, I was feeling like, what do you think about, I mean, what is like to be something from you? It's like, what? I just, uh, I, I do have my brain. I can think, I can get a PhD in, in physics or astronomy or whatever. And uh, it, it's true the other way around. In Hungary, uh, it, it's completely, it was completely the other way around. But, uh, but I, I am a woman, I'm a cisgender woman. And for them, it was crazy that I was 30 with no children, not not married to anyone it was actually a big problem because um uh, in order to open a bank account uh, they asked me whether i was married or not i was like 
how is this going to be important for you? And they were like, yeah, because after you will uh, get married, so for sure I was going to get married, um, you will change your surname, uh, getting your husband uh, surname. So I was going to marry a man. And I was like, and I was also changing my surname. And then it was, that, that was violent. I was just opening bank, bank accounts. And uh, as she, well, they say, uh, it's not like that we can choose. It's mandatory to leave. And uh, we, we are still talking in 2024 about um, uh, maternity uh, problems. How am I supposed to have a family if I'm supposed to change country to country every two or three years up to 40? It's like not biological possible. So I totally agree with the thanks for letting me talking broadly about it. The, the, the our system, the academic system, uh, it's very fucked up. Not only about gender and uh, uh, discrimination problem, but uh, even if you're I mean, and plenty of uh, white, gender, heterosexual, uh, male. Uh, that experience some severe um, mental issues. Okay, sorry. <laughs> if I want to say in many public Spanish universities, it's not mandatory to work abroad to get a permanent position. You, we can, we can see. Yeah, but 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 the skills I see is mandatory. Okay. In about country, uh, Rocio. Uh, well, I am all in that. And I, and I have working in Germany, but also in East European countries, as Hungary, as Czechia, and also in Morocco. During your career, you can travel to different countries, not only the rich I ones. The intersection is very interesting, but uh, during the round table, we have spoken about a lot, lot of more issues, and I think mm -hmm. uh, we can discuss sure. that afterwards because yeah. it's very interesting. Thank you. Sorry, can I just add two things? Please. I think. But this has because uh, uh, at some point could we maybe uh, make a protest and suggest to the European Union that we make it illegal to value living abroad for more than three months in cities because I think it's this is obviously abusive like that they value that you leave your country it mm, violates all inclusion equality programs everything because you shouldn't have to do that it's too much and also journals that make money. Yeah, <laughs> you're not capitalism. Yeah. I want to thank all these people trying to share uh, their the ideas in the institute. This is the first round table organized uh, in, in this matter in the institute. I am sorry, I, I have to introduce myself. I am Pepa Mastrosa. I work here on, on, on a, I am coordinating the equality committee till two months ago it was a equality committee between men and women and uh, now following the, the resolution from the united nations we have uh, included intersectionality uh, but uh, i miss in the in the thing you have been discussing uh, I have been working with the problem of uh, women entering into the academy and from 40 years ago. Um, and uh, we have been following how has been the progress. We make a lot of number on this and we can identify some, some discrimination. We have correct some others we still uh, were not allowed to 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 solve to be solved uh, and and the thing i miss in the in the round table is how important because i well i, I normally look at the number and see how many i i was asking before to Eleonora that uh, this reference paper by the royal astronomical society how many people, how is the percentage of people that fill the survey, because this is important in order to be if it is biased or not. And, and now that uh, I, I have to change my quality plan in the Institute, and for this challenge, 
I want to identify and to quantify how, how large is the population that identify not in the uh, heterosexual and how which are the particular problems for this population and how big it, it is because in the, the sick we we don't know uh, I discussed this with the Prisma organization that they need to put number to see if the because we are in, in Spanish you say poner el parche ante la herida because we don't know in the physic uh, how large is this population because if it's one percent of the people well it is uh, is is something that of course need to be taken into account but it's not the same that is if uh, like in the case of women we are the 50 percent so that is, I would like to know the, the, if you have some reference where I can have a look. I, I have been following this question of the queer that came from the patriarchado, just to raise uh, women uh, in the 90s. Uh, and this happened in Canada or, or, or United States. So that is, it was uh, well known. And I have been following for this a lot this year what is going on. But I need a statistic of this situation because when, when I look to the intersexuality, the number, the percentage of people that are intersexual are really uh, is less than 0.01%. So that is something that uh, uh, now when you take the challenge, I need to, to make a, a new equality plan that make the life easier in the Institute. I need to, to quantify how, how big the population and which type of discrimination are having and all these things. Do you have numbers? Do you... Actually, I would recommend you to look at surveys because there are many surveys uh, reports every year done by several associations but i don't know i think she reviewed some of them but also prisma and the association frequently gives uh, talks of this kind so maybe i would recommend to actually check out their resources the prisma the number for the they don't uh, the numbers of the uh, of the life the society or in astronomy uh, in, in, in the, in the, in the Every year, there is a, a committee uh, for equality of women in science. Okay. Uh, they provide the numbers, and we make correction of what uh, measurement we need to implement okay. in order to solve this. But in the case, uh, I, I have been talking with Prisma. And they have the challenge now making by the Commission de, de, de Igualdad de, de, de SIC just to provide the numbers for this, uh, for LGTBIQ+. Okay, so um, it's how to get the number. How? Okay. Sorry, but have you done a survey in the SIC? No. no. Well, I mean, don't you do it? Yeah. yeah. Just start now. No. Yeah. I mean, that's the point. But Sam, I mean, you, there are tools uh, on Google. You just need to click and add the tools. And then you do your own survey in the Institute if this is what you need. Or you talk with other institutions to get like a survey in Spain, in Andalusia, or whatever you want. The fact that there are no numbers out there doesn't mean that it is not possible to have those numbers. It also depends on the numbers that you want. Uh, I don't know, I mean, I'm an expert on Italy, maybe who is from Spain knows better the situation here, uh, but there are studies going on. Uh, the fact that now the, the, the numbers about women and men are so uh, effective and robust is because uh, it's ages since we started doing this, while uh, on the other side, for LGBTQI plus uh, 
uh, numbers, uh, we're still in the process. So if you need those numbers for whatever reason, uh, I would recommend you to uh, talk with people that could have it. And if you're looking for numbers in Spain, I'm not the most suitable person. Um, but also to, to do some like surveys. However, um, I mean, I do like numbers, I'm a scientist, but I don't think that, I, I'm not sure if this is like the best approach to solve the problem. Because um, as I said before, it says this since we all acknowledge the fact that there is a gender um, um, problem between male and female representation in the academia, but uh, it is not solved. So um, it's good to do some regulation, looking at numbers, I'm totally fine with it, but it's not only doing this kind of stuff that you solve the problem. I mean, this is what we are uh, learning with women and, and men. Uh, also, there is another point of discussion. Uh, for example, for women, uh, there is what they call a paradox, uh, the fact that the Southern uh, European countries um, who are more like uh, conservative on their gender issues uh, that have the higher percentage of astronomers. I'm talking about astronomy because this is how it is. So for example, in Spain and in Italy, there are more female permanent positions in astronomy than, for example, in Germany and the UK. But this is not actually a paradox. This is related to the fact that the research, the job of the, uh, the, research, uh, the job of a researcher is uh, well paid in Germany and UK and not paid so much uh, like in Spain or in Italy. So there is also this problem. Um, I just wanted to mention it because uh, this never came out and I think it's important also. Just, just to comment on what you're saying, um, um, I think that having the numbers doesn't tell you how to solve the problems. But having the numbers it's important to know whether once you have implemented an action, if this action is useful or not to change the numbers. So you have, you have to know the numbers and, and follow them up a lot of the time mm -hmm. and in relation with the actions you put against the problems. And if you don't have them, you cannot measure. Just to clarify, there are many tools that you can use out there to actually measure all of these things. If you need training, I am happy to do a training workshop. I actually do training workshops, uh, but there are many tools out there. And if you do a survey at CSIC uh, studying these issues, it's publishable material. So I don't understand why yeah, you yeah. don't do the survey. <laughs> but, but in CSIC, for instance, we have uh, we, we ask for having the, the mm -hmm. information uh, to be created in women and men, because at the beginning we had no numbers about that. But we don't have the information analyzed or whatever to have to to, to be able to to make such a, a research on the numbers mm -hmm. about, about anything. So you have to survey, and in that case, you you are willing to accept that you won't have the whole information because only people answering to to the survey will be included. So um, I think that it's important to to I mean to know how many how many boxes we have to put or identifying people, for example, and to know how many of them we need in order it can be made automatically and anonymously. And, and then we are we have access to the full information and then to the full statistics. Yeah. Can I answer a little question, a little thing about what you were saying? Um, at the beginning, I know that that's a way to prove the impact of the actions that are being taken on that matter. But I'm really concerned about the idea of uh, classifying things in boxes, because when it comes to this kind of divisions, because you guys are talking about women and men, there's there's gay men that are not subjected to the same violence that other men, or are not uh, following the same path as other men, but they're still men. And also there are lesbian women that are not being uh, touched by the same um, issues that sees a uh, heterosexual woman. There's trans women, there's trans men, there are non minor people, there are intersexual people, which are things that are not the same. Uh, so 
how are we building these categories? And most importantly, because I think that this issue really reconnects with the thing I was telling at the beginning, most importantly is not how do we call these people, how do we divide these people, how do we categorize these people? Because also between women and men, there's like racialized men that doesn't have the same issues as white men, racialized women that doesn't have other issues. I mean, this is all about intersectionality. And to do so, I would focus less on these categories and I will focus more about group interventions, listening to the people, making doing this survey to track how's the um, how's the plurality of the community in that institute, in science, in this department, whatever. Just let's track what is the diversity like in this place. And then we take these people and we talk to them, we hear them, we hear their own struggles. We also take other uh, intersections into account. For example, if they're also working or not, because violence are not the same if you're upper class or lower class or middle class. So I think that this kind of uh, impacts are a little bit sterile when it comes to real changes. And I, I really focus on this idea of putting these people that are touched by these issues on the table to speak about solutions. And uh, I will mention here that uh, we, as the group Antiracismo Granada, wanted to communicate and to talk with the Department of Equality in University of Granada, with the Vice Rectorado, uh, because they were um, redoing some things in the equality uh, procedure, in the equality uh, manifesto that they also had. And they said that they're well covered just with the gender issues. They don't need like anti-racist approaches to that. And we were like, really? Are you aware of the difficulties of people uh, coming from the South in general, like from under the Ecuador, coming from African countries, coming from Latin American countries that are paying more taxes, that are, need to work here sometimes, that they're really pending on this visa thing? I mean, of course, their inclusion within science and within this kind of institutes, institutes sorry, is not the same. And if you add on that, on top of that, the queer thing, the queer thing, <laughs> it's even more complicated. So instead of uh, putting people into boxes or categories, I will first track how is the environment in my place and then talk to them. I know that's not very scientist, but I think that when it comes to uh, improving people wellness in this kind of environment we don't need numbers we need actions we have five more minutes so if you want a uh, last I question very and brief. a last reflection for you it's not actually a question it's more like the conclusion for me is that we have home homework to do in the in the area and the Pacific so that's like as you said we have to do this this work if you don't have it and Thank you very much. We have five minutes, so if you want to say some words to close the table, we are very welcome. Please, Hara. Okay, just some, some things to evaluate. When you make harass, anti harassment protocols or anti mobbing protocols or protocols for working with people in general and your environment, what we usually do is the best, first thing you need to do is surveying the demographics of your group because you need to know what your group problems are. To identify risk scenarios, for instance, if you are making an anti fire protocol, what is the risk that something is set on fire? If you're monitoring harassment, then what are the scenarios where harassment is likely to happen? And you usually just survey at different groups what is the probability that they will experience something. But also you measure how frequently do they feel feelings of abandoning, abandoning the, the place? How included do they feel? Do they feel otherhood? Do they have frequent thoughts of leaving the academia? And you also get data of people who live in this way. If all institutions in Spain do this, which is what they should be doing, you have data from all institutions. And it's actually basic statistics. You get very good numbers from this. Like it's a um, within probability measure convergence. Uh, but it's actually easy. People have been doing this for decades. It's not, you know, yeah. Thank you. Uh, so <laughs> last, please, uh, last uh, take home messages from here to there or from there to here, as you wish. Oscar? <laughs> Uh, no, I, I'm not in the PC. Uh, we don't need to know the number of blind person in the PSIC. 
to, to think about a solution for this blind person, for singular person. Uh, I don't know if you know the, the, the percent of LGBT person in the society. We, we could make a, 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 a quick liquid. Do you think that is less than 1%, between 1 and 5%, 5% to 10% or more than 10%? What do you think? Yeah, more than 10%. More than 10%. It's 25, 9% in the society. Yeah. 9% in Spain. So th this is the data. I don't really need to know if in the Pacific we have only one or three or 20 people. I we need to think about the inclusion uh, methods to, to make all the inclusion with the other people. Even though it's one person. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much, Rocio. I just have the feeling that I set this thing on fire. <laughs> Quite enough. <laughs> I actually once almost burned the university, but that was an accident. <laughs> and it, it was me. <laughs> and it was my fault. <laughs> and I'm so sorry. <laughs> now, thank you for listening. It was great to be here. If you want to discuss more, we can talk later in the break. Hey, Leonora. Hi. Um, no, I just want to say that I um, Gender studies are, are a field of knowledge. It's not like we wake up one morning and we do have a feeling about all the differences that we are, that, that we have on a certain, I don't know, about gender or about uh, sexual orientation or about whatever. It's, uh, there are people that actually wrote papers and the say there are books, there is it's an open field of research there are books uh, publishing daily uh, so since uh, i believe in the in research uh, i think that the 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 solution can pass through studying it uh, there is material so uh, i think that knowing more and more and more and also practicing what we learn uh, talking with other people uh, is like the, the basic the zero level to, to start a discussion about it. Um, so I, I don't know, I can provide some milestones, I think that we can all uh, can, but then uh, it's, it's really like, it's the same when you do a research for your paper. Maybe you know a very famous reference and then look reading that paper, you have to read more and more and more papers to get uh, the sense of that exactly sentence. And this is like the same for gender studies. And um, after doing this, uh, it, and, and at least for me, it became very uh, clear that uh, you never stop and learning new things. And also, um, I mean, I feel that um, the it's true that we need population and we need the data. Uh, it's just that stems are different than gender studies. Okay, so if we um, keep trying to translate our own scientific approach to this specific topic, we may not uh, reach the goal. This is my feeling. And thanks a lot for this uh, opportunity to discuss about it. Thank you very much. Please have a big applause. Thank you. Thank you very much for attending this round table. It has been very interesting. I think now we will have the time to take some data and to discuss about that. I guess it's foreseen. If someone in, in the Institute needs help with this kind of help and support with this kind of LGBTQ plus stuff, please contact the Gracia, which will be more than glad to help you. And please do not forget that on Friday at 7.30, we see everybody at the demonstration at Plaza Isabel la Católica, second IAA gay LGBTQ plus mm -hmm. demonstration. I, just <laughs> yeah. I, I have a free dance workshop on Thursday. <laughs> we are dance workshop. Please ask me about it if you're interested. <laughs> <laughs>